morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest installment of our virtual programming series. I'm Greg Menken, Executive Director of the Adam Smith Society. And first and foremost, I'd like to wish everyone continued health and well-being during these very difficult times. Um, the mission of the Adam Smith Society to promote discussion around the benefits of free enterprise remains as important as ever. We'll continue to offer opportunities to hear from leading experts on time, uh, online, and we look forward to the time when we can meet in person once again. So thanks for joining us today to get in your weekly Smith Sock Fix. Uh, if you're not already a member of Smith Sock and would like to learn more, please visit us online at adamsmithsociety.com. Joining us today is Professor Ryan Hanley of Boston College to discuss Adam Smith, capitalism, and the good life. So if you need to take your mind off the coronavirus for a few minutes, you've joined us at a good time today. Professor Hanley is Professor of Political Science at Boston College and has held visiting appointments or fellowships at Yale, Harvard, and the University of Chicago, where he received his PhD. A specialist on Adam Smith and the political philosophy of the Enlightenment period, he is the author of a number of uh, uh, numerous books, including his most recent work, Our Great Purpose, Adam Smith on Living a Better Life. Most notably for me, uh, is that he had been scheduled to be a featured speaker at our national meeting in New York City last month, uh, which of course was canceled. So Professor, uh, we're very grateful to you for joining us online today. Uh, the professor will give a 15 to 20 minute talk followed by audience Q&A. Please note this conference is being recorded. You may ask questions in the question box in your GoToWebinar controls. Questions will be read aloud to the group by my colleague, Dean Ball. Please keep your questions and comments brief and state your full name and chapter affiliation to ask a question. You do not have to wait until the end of the professor's talk. You may ask a question at any time. And with that, Professor, the screen is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Greg, for the kind introduction and indeed for the opportunity to be able to join you and everybody else. Indeed, the opportunity to join anyone uh, right now in this age of quarantine is, uh, is something that we can all be grateful for. But in any case, it's a, it's a real honor and pleasure to be part of the, uh, this great uh, online series here that Adam Smith Society and Manhattan Institute are focusing on. Um, as, uh, as Greg mentioned, I'm going to try and keep things fairly brief here. And I thought I'd organize my presentation really around, uh, within the short 15 minutes that we have, a very brief introduction to what I take to be three genuinely core, crucial ideas of Adam Smith himself. And you could think of these three ideas, uh, and Smith is vast and contains multitudes. There's a lot we could talk about. But Smith, uh, I think these three ideas are important from the perspective of why Smith might matter now, especially, and what it is, what is it in his thought that uh, might matter most in our current moment. And so um, to get us into that, I want to start first and foremost with this first idea of exactly why Smith thought a free society built on free markets was so valuable. He is, after all, the famous founding father of the modern uh, free market system. And why exactly was he such a passionate champion of this? And I think Smith was so for one specific reason, and indeed for a specific moral reason, uh, befitting the moral philosopher that he, in fact, was, as he made a, a living from. And this concerns the capacity of a free society uh, built on free markets to generate what Smith himself called a quote unquote, universal opulence that benefits the least well off. And thus point blank, what justified commercial society in Smith's mind, what led him to champion what later became known as capitalism, but the free market system built upon free institutions, was precisely its capacity, first and foremost, to alleviate policy. And so case in point, uh, and we have a couple of brief uh, uh, textual slides to put up. I wonder, um, uh, Peter, if you could put up that first slide uh, in which Smith makes this argument. And here it is, this is a passage from his first book. Smith wrote two books. This is from The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it's his first mention of the invisible hand. Smith only mentions it twice in his published texts, once in the theory of moral sentiments, once in the wealth of nations. And here in this first slide, we have his first mention of the invisible hand. And the invisible hand's job here, and I won't read through the entire slide, but I'll leave it up there for you to see. 
Smith's argument here is that the invisible hand, quote unquote, serves to provide a nearly equal distribution of the necessaries of life. That is to say, the least well-off among us are the ones who benefit the most from this remarkable distributive mechanism of the invisible hand. Oh, there's a tremendous amount that could be said about this and should be said about this, and perhaps we could talk in more detail in discussion. But I wanted to begin here because I think that this is important to begin um, uh, with this because it sets the record straight on Smith and why he himself championed commercial society, and also why Smith might be useful in discussion today. Clearly, as we head into 2020 and the presidential elections, among other things, uh, there's a remarkable debate emerging, as all of you know, between two different factions within contemporary political life with, ground, with regards to the um, uh, uh, ideological divisions on economic questions. Of course, one of the great stories in recent years is the dramatic increase and the exacerbated worries about inequality in contemporary American life. And in fact, there are no shortage of people ready to condemn the free market system that's developed over the past half century on the grounds of its immorality, specifically because of its inequality that it produces or exacerbates. I think it's right here that Smith can be potentially most useful in contemporary popular discussion. As I've wanted to emphasize just by looking at this first quote, Smith waged his battles, his defense of commercial society, specifically on the grounds of its moral benefits, not in terms of reducing inequality, but on the grounds of poverty relief. And it seems to me that Smith is really very unique in our contemporary field. He sought to employ the institutions often associated with the political right, free markets, to achieve the grounds and the ends often associated with the political left, the relief of the estate of the least well-off among us. As such, I think he offers a very unique opportunity for us to begin to broaden some of our horizons and move beyond certain familiar ideological divisions and can speak directly to this question that needs to be discussed in greater detail today of the morality of commercial society. So first point then, uh, free societies for Smith demand preservation on the grounds of the remarkable material opulence they generate. But this leads to a second point, and I think that this also is something that we need to think about today more than ever. Smith recognized that free market societies, put as bluntly as possible, were not all upsides. And in fact, Smith was profoundly sensitive, I think, and brutally honest with regard to the palpable downsides, as it were, of commercial societies. Um, Smith himself was uh, prone to use a very specific word to, do, uh, to capture some of these downsides, and that word is, quote unquote, corruption. Um, Smith knew that insofar as capitalism is built on the pursuit of self-interest, it has the potential to incentivize, as it were, a certain side of selfishness. Now, a great deal of Smith's moral philosophy is dedicated to developing this particular critique. And case in point would be a uh, second paragraph that I'd like to have before you. And Pete, if you can put up the second slide here. Um, this uh, second slide comes from, uh, this is uh, the poor man's son here. It's a nice little parable, uh, what we could call a parable, that comes in the middle of the theory of moral sentiments. And here he develops the actual experience of life in a commercial society as experienced by a young man, in this case, a young man uh, of a poor man, uh, a son of a poor man, who has been visited with ambition and wants to climb the ladder. This is a challenging life, to say the least. And as Smith develops it here, as you can read, but also in the development further of these paragraphs, Smith attests to some of the real palpable challenges of uh, living in a society that incentivizes self-interest. That said, this is the side of, quote unquote, corruption that Smith develops in his first book and in his uh, moral philosophy, the theory of moral sentiments. It turns out though, and this is what I wanna emphasize for, for, for the present audience, is that corruption is also central to the economic argument that Smith develops in The Wealth of Nations. 
So The Wealth of Nations, his famous book on uh, uh, his famous contribution that launched uh, the, the scientific study of uh, economics, The Wealth of Nations is developed in five books, five different sections. And the first book begins with some very famous praises of divided, specialized labor. He uses in the first chapter the image of the pin factory, in which 18 different workers are uh, coordinating in their specialized labor to produce uh, at uh, remarkable uh, levels of productivity pins. Now, all of that is well known, and it's very familiar, the arguments in terms of uh, economies of scale, increased productivity, lower consumer prices. All of these are the sort of um, the, the foundational arguments of Smith's, uh, of Smith's claims with regard to commercial society. What's interesting, though, for those who are able to persist and make it to the end of the 900-page book that The Wealth of Nations is, in the fifth book of The Wealth of Nations, Smith shows that this same engine of opulence, this same system of divided specialized labor, also has a downside, a flip side. And his specific claim is that the benefits, even though they were down to all, excuse me, in the sense of uh, increased uh, productivity, they also can potentially come at the expense of individual well being. And in the fifth book of The Wealth of Nations, Smith turns to the other side of repetitive specialized labor. And there he tells us that this renders the workers engaged in it subject to a quote unquote mental mutilation. And this, uh, if we could put up the final slide here, uh, item number three here. Yeah, this comes from uh, book five of The Wealth of Nations. And here Smith describes the actual phenomenology, we might say in philosophy, the actual experience of what it's like to be a worker in such a society. And Smith thinks, and he's very explicit here, that this has the potential to be deeply corrupting, deeply dangerous to human well-being to participate in precisely these labor forms that make this universal opulence possible. From all of this then, we're left in a very interesting position Taken altogether, Smith thinks and recognizes that commercial society brings palpable material benefits, but also significant moral dangers. This leads him to a very specific dilemma. Given that the engine of our moral material progress is also potentially an engine of moral corruption, what then is to be done in light of this double-edged sword? And this is the third and final point that I want to close on, because it seems to me that um, it's here that Smith has perhaps most to teach us. And put in terms of our contemporary debate, what is to be done in the face of these questions, I see three options on the table. What is to be done in the face of the moral corruption of market orders? There is an argument very familiar to all here. Simply do nothing. That is, except that corruption is the price that we simply have to pay for universal art opulence. There is a side of free market fundamentalism that's not unfamiliar in contemporary discussions that would simply say we can't have our cake and eat it too. Material opulence comes at a moral cost. The sooner we accept that and are realists about it, the better. One option then. A second option from the other side of the table, the ideological spectrum, that simply these costs are uh, far outweigh these benefits, and that in fact, given the dangers of markets, we might do well to seek an alternative. And this too is a familiar position today, and we know from the resurgence of interest in what is going by the name of democratic socialism, that the idea that the costs are too high for the benefits and that we ought to think more creatively, this too is an option on the table. What then about Smith? And this is what I think Smith adds to the discussion. I think Smith presents an alternative third way that makes him especially useful now. As a true friend of market societies, I think Smith calls us to face up and to try and address forthrightly the challenges of market societies so that in, we can best preserve and restore the promise of material opulence they bring. And so that's the third point, and here's where I want to close. What I think Smith really contributes to our discussion today is his recognition that we need to do something, speaking broadly, to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms. The question then, of course, becomes, what ought we to do? What is to be done? Uh, uh, on the one hand, 
Smith thinks that there is a specific place for moral philosophy conceived in a certain way. And indeed, in his ethics, he develops at great length a theory of, quote unquote, virtue. And he says that moral philosophy is important for describing certain character virtues, virtuous actions that help us better understand one thing. And that is, in his words, quote, what constitutes the excellent and praiseworthy character. So one way to respond to this problem is to develop a certain image, a certain conception of human flourishing and of virtue that's suited to the world in which we live and can perhaps uh, stave off some of these worries about moral corruption. Now that I have to say has been uh, one of the large focuses of my particular work. The book that Greg mentioned at the outset is indeed largely focused on the question of the moral virtues that Smith was interested in and the place that they have in a contemporary uh, uh, capitalist uh, setting. I wanna close though by looking at another side of Smith's response to this because I think he gives a two pronged approach. One approach to the question of how do we maximize the harm, or I'm sorry, maximize the benefits and minimize the harms? One approach is indeed uh, the approach given by uh, develop a different moral philosophy that can best support modern life. But the other question comes out not, or the other prong comes out not in Smith's moral philosophy, but in fact in his economics. And to see this, I want to go back just to the final line of that third slide that's uh, uh, the third passage up here on the slide that's up on your screens. And that is point blank. Moral philosophy is only one of two responses to corruption. The other, very remarkably, quote unquote, government. In this remarkable paragraph, in this remarkable paragraph sketching out some of the dangers, the downsides, the negative externalities of commercial society, Smith, the founding father of capitalism, points to a specific role for government. Now, the question, and I hope this is the question that can lead in perhaps to some more general discussion, what exactly is that role of government? This seems to me an important question to ask for Smith specialists such as myself. What exactly did he understand in that respect? And for citizens of, uh, of the world in which we live, this rapidly changing world. For students of Smith, the question becomes, how extensive a role of government did he envision, given the fact that he explicitly says that there is a role of government in staving off these negative externalities? That's given rise to a debate among specialists such as myself. We have, um, there are rival camps now among Smith scholars. Left Smithians and right Smithians are uh, actively debating these questions. I don't wanna get too deep in the weeds about of Smith scholarship, though I'm happy to talk more about that as we move forward. But aside from the narrow and specialized question about um, what this means for Smith and Smith scholars, it also, I think, is the compelling question that we have to face now as we move forward in the wake of quarantines, shutdowns, and the CARES Act, which is, if indeed this perennial problem, exactly what is the role of government in maximizing the benefits, at least, especially to the least well-off, and minimizing the harms, especially to the least well-off, what exactly ought to be done moving forward in so far, if, if indeed our goal is to extend the promise of quote unquote universal opulence truly to all citizens of a modern marketplace. Um, I, I know that many of us have coronavirus fatigue and that uh, uh, it seems that everywhere we turn, this is the only thing that we're able to think or talk about. I hope that Smith contributes more uh, to our current discussions than simply responding to um, how we move forward uh, past uh, the age of quarantine. But I do think that this is one of the important ways that uh, we need to think creatively moving forward. And Smith can give us some guidance in helping us think critically and define the problem of what role of government, how extensive ought it to be, if indeed we hope to extend this promise as broadly as possible. And so I think with that in place, uh, I think I'll uh, conclude uh, these um, opening remarks and hopefully that's given us something uh, both to reflect on, uh, hopefully there's some takeaways about Smith's key claims there and uh, uh, something to give us uh, uh, some inroads to some conversation as well. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, at this point, I would like to open up the floor to questions.
Um, so you can please start uh, submitting your questions now. As a reminder, please give us your full name and chapter affiliation to ask your questions. And as we collect them, uh, my mm -hmm. colleague Dean Ball will read them uh, out loud. Uh, I'd like to kick things off, Professor. Uh, you are not just an expert in uh, Adam Smith and, and the Enlightenment, but you are a political science professor. Uh, you mentioned the CARES Act and things like that. So how, how do you see the fiscal st stimulus uh, as a result of uh, the situation today? Uh, playing out in the uh, election in November? Oh, uh, political scientists are uh, famously bad predictors, and anybody that talks about 2016 will uh, uh, clearly be able to point a lot of fingers at people, uh, myself and people in our profession, as to what we thought might happen. Um, I'm hesitant to, uh, to make any sort of uh, proclamations like that, given the limits of my expertise. But um, one thing that will be undeniably true is that um, people are looking for help and that um, Smith has already uh, laid out a case that government should help, I'm speaking very broadly, and as government starts helping, as government, as the payouts to different institutions, to different sorts of institutions start becoming manifest with the CARES Act, once those begin, it's hard to stop them. And so I think one thing that Smith was um, cognizant of, and he is a small government guy that, uh, at the end of the day, that um, dependence and uh, iterated handouts can become extremely, extremely debilitating and can even indeed hamper the long-term growth of a market. So I think while Smith himself recognizes that there is a place for emergency intervention or would uh, recognize that, it is a remarkable concatenation of events, the fact that these are coming, the first round is coming as we are right entering the thick of an election season, and surely more will have to come and will be coming as we come closer into November. When does it stop and how will it stop? Surely a great deal of voter behavior is going to be uh, determined by the hope and the expectation that there will be some continued aid and relief. And that's going to change things in ways that I don't think any of us can realistically predict, but is going to be a big factor coming into 2020. Uh, Nick Schroback from our Wharton chapter asks, broadly speaking, what periods in U.S. history would Adam Smith most approve of and which would he disapprove of? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I think when I think of um, Smithian periods, I would go back to not simply the founding, but the early 19th century. The presidencies of uh, Jefferson, but especially of Madison. Madison was, as a matter of fact, a keen reader of Smith. But the idea that America was engaged in a dramatic process of uh, significant infrastructure creation, uh, roads, canals, bridges. Smith, when he talks about the actual role of government, uh, the role of government in supporting via public works the sorts of institutions that will help um, uh, support the uh, goals of um, uh, uh, movement of products uh, in the benefit of markets. It seems to me that Madison uh, uh, was really taking a page from exactly what Smith wanted out of government in The Wealth of Nations in uh, Book Five. So I think that that would be a celebratory moment in American history. Um, uh, what moments would he be more skeptical of? Um, I suppose the easy and low-hanging fruit would be uh, uh, the extremely extensive programs, perhaps, of uh, New Deal uh, uh, it, it, um, and, and FDR. But even then, I want to qualify that by saying, um, uh, insofar as FDR and Smith both believe that there were uh, extensive uh, arguments that we should be privileging the well-being of the poor first. I think that Smith and FDR played exactly on the same page, and I know that that could be seen as controversial, exactly on the same page in their ambitions, where they differ, and where I think Smith would be deeply skeptical of that period of American history, would be the um, mechanisms used to get there, where FDR and Smith, of course, part ways, is not on the question of, who should we be seeking to benefit? There they agree. 
but how that benefit is to be provided. And I do think that Smith would have some hesitancies with the mechanisms proposed in the New Deal, even as he's being enthusiastic and wholly applauding of, uh, of the uh, ambitions and aims of those projects. Great question. Uh, ben Cox from our Boston University chapter asks, is there a country that you think is furthest along in sorting out the correct balance between free markets and government the way that we may look to as a model to tailor future policy? Oh, that's especially interesting now and in seeing, um, it's hard not to think of that in terms of uh, how different countries have been approaching lockdowns and reopenings. Um, certainly, uh, Germany's capacity to continue uh, 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 their economies and their productive economies throughout all this makes them an admirable model in a variety of different ways. At the same time, I don't think I want to become uh, uh, an advocate for um, Germany as the Smithian model. I, I look, I, I'll stay close to home. I think in many ways, uh, America, for all of the palpable challenges that are before us, and I do realize that that's uh, perhaps the fourth time I've used the word palpable today, um, for all the real challenges that uh, lie before us, I don't think Smith would be disappointed were he to come to our world today. The recognition that uh, markets drive opulence and that there is yet the need for safety nets. This seems to me to be a balance that we struggle with achieving, but insofar as that is the balance that we seek to really uh, achieve in the U.S., I think Smith would be wholly amenable to that uh, and less concerned for fundamental overhaul than for tinkerings about finding that balance. So um, I don't think that there's an easy model out there, though there are obviously flourishing economies. Uh, and at the risk of sounding uh, uh, too uh, perhaps nationalistic or populist myself, uh, I do think that Smith would smile upon uh, at least the intentions we have with our current uh, system, uh, though also recognizing that there is tinkering that needs to be done. Rachel Braun uh, from our Wharton chapter as well asks, what do you believe can explain the recent rise of democratic socialism and even communism in America, where a free market approach has traditionally been embraced? Yeah, it's remarkable that, um, well, I'm glad that these questions are coming from Wharton. I was a Penn undergrad, so uh, I think back to my undergraduate days when I hear these questions. And that's probably important substantively here, um, insofar as, as somebody that makes a living teaching students and teaching undergraduates as well as graduate students, um, we know, of course, that the sympathies for democratic socialism are in many ways coming from a younger generation. And, um, uh, and one wants to ask why? And, you know, as I exercise my sympathetic capacity to put myself in their shoes, um, uh, and sympathy is a deeply Smithian sentiment, it's the key idea in the, in the theory of moral sentiments, but as I try and enter into their positions and think through their positions, I recognize uh, that um, for young people, especially college seniors that are graduating and living back home with mom and dad and looking at a decimated uh, uh, set of job prospects, that um, it's not hard to think for why a decent, well-intended, kind, and humane young person looking at their current economic prospects and looking at what we also know to be uh, uh, not insignificant levels of in income inequality, especially between the highest and lowest quartiles, that it's not difficult to understand why a decent person might feel those sorts of things. Um, and in fact, when I hear my students, I teach at Boston College, a Jesuit university, uh, they often invoke concepts of social justice. And I think those come from and lead the, those come from good places in a human heart. And far be it for me to try and squelch those. What I think, of course, needs to be done and the sort of work that we need to do as social scientists, political scientists, economists, is to uh, talk about how exactly one maximizes and operationalizes those good intentions. Because uh, it's all too easy to be seduced by the idea that there is only, in fact, one moral path forward for one who has those, uh, those good intentions. And that is to drastically reconfigure certain types of economic arrangements that might be eliciting disillusionment from young people now. So in terms of my own work, I, I uh, steadfastly believe that it's up to students themselves to make their own decisions on 
questions of capitalism or socialism. And in fact, I'm teaching a course next spring for my undergraduates exactly on this, on socialism or capitalism. And there will read Marx, there will read Smith, we'll read the heavy hitters on both sides. And I take it very seriously, the idea that I shouldn't be steering them to one normative conclusion or another. What I do want them to try to see is, uh, provided they come to the table with these laudable and very humane sympathies for those in need, what exactly are the best ways to operationalize those and what can we learn from modern economics about systems that are more and less likely to be able to deliver uh, the goods, as it were, that will gratify those sympathies. So, um, I, so I, I, I take very seriously when students um, uh, speak as democratic socialists disillusioned with the system. It seems to me that they are already halfway to being persuaded by Adam Smith, or if not persuaded, at least ready to hear the argument, and in many ways, often a new and unfamiliar argument, that in fact, there are moral grounds on the basis of poverty relief, uh, questions of social justice that could lead one directly to Smith and the economic systems that he defends. Um, Daniel Newland from our Dallas professional chapter asks, what do you see as some short and long-term impacts on the American public of a national debt that is seemingly growing exponentially? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, as the parent of a young child, uh, as a teenager, uh, boy, I worry about what the future is. And it's hard for me to think through this in my professional capacity as opposed to my capacity as a parent and as a citizen thinking about the future that might uh, come, uh, come ahead. What I think has to be taken very seriously right now, and I'm going to limit myself to my capacity as a Smith scholar to answer this question, is that um, Smith himself thinks that there is an undeniable uh, role for government expenditure. And he is as forthright as he can be. And if you read the fifth book of The Wealth of Nations, he tells us that there, the government role is very specific, but it's limited to three objects. One, expenditures on national defense. Secondly, expenditures on the institutions and infrastructure of justice. And third, what we've already alluded to before, institutions of public works. Smith understands that there has to be a balance between uh, inflow and outflow, between the revenue that is brought in through taxation and the limited but necessary expenditures. Here's where I think Smith would balk at our current system, seeing that, um, uh, and one here, one just can't escape from the reality of the CARES Act and the enormous figures that are being remarkably casually thrown around, that uh, this is going to have long-term consequences that none of us can predict, but that Smith was very keen to warn us against. And so as a Smithian, I think uh, one can't help but be concerned about the, uh, the long-term questions of the national debt. Randy Zhu? from our New York City professional chapter uh, asks, Smith lived during a time when material production was perhaps the key constraint on wealth and well-being. Today, in many large economies, we have overcapacity in goods and even some services. How might this affect Adam Smith's worldview or interpretation? Yeah, so that's a, so one of the key questions there is um, uh, why do we have uh, overcapacity and overproduction? I have to say that I'm doing this interview here from um, from Wisconsin, uh, where I'm here with family, and um, it's been rather remarkable to see the dairy industry. And at the same time that there are solicitations from food banks in Milwaukee for uh, for uh, for, for aid, there are also the dairy industry is because of overproduction is forced to send a lot of milk down drains. Now there are creative people trying to uh, square this circle and solve this problem, but again, the the question would come back to um, um, how exactly can we render this more efficient, and are there uh, human induced inefficiencies that are preventing um, goods from reaching market in the most efficient way possible. Um, Smith was deeply aware of these problems in his day. It's not only questions of, uh, 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 of production, but also um, questions of, uh, especially for Smith, one of the most interesting areas are questions of famine. 
and exactly what the proper response ought to be when there are food shortages that come, not just from uh, production issues, but also, uh, as it were, acts beyond human control, famine. And um, I'm, I've been thinking about revisiting some of that, given the remarkable things that we're, that we're hearing from uh, the NGOs right now about the prospect of world food shortages and how those might affect uh, especially certain African nations, uh, given a conglomeration of different effects coming up here. Um, so I think that uh, while Smith in many ways wrote for a different world, as the questioner rightly notes, uh, late 18th century is not the incipient 21st century. But these questions of um, how to maximize production and efficiently meet consumer demand, there, I mean, insofar as Smith privileges that question, I think he remains a, a living and valuable resource for us right now. Graham Johnson from our Brigham Univers Young University chapter asks, are there any theories of Adam Smith that you feel do not translate to today's time? Ah, um, yes, <laughs> actually. Um, there's a couple places in his moral philosophy, especially that I think uh, are somewhat um, less relevant, I have to say. You know, one of a version of this question that I sometimes get is, is there anything that Smith was just wrong about? And uh, I think that he was deeply wrong uh, on, um, uh, among other things, the experience of romantic love. Uh, there he has some, um, as a lifelong bachelor, he has some very critical things to say about uh, that experience. And maybe as a, uh, a reasonably happy uh, uh, married bourgeois uh, modern individual, Smith and I just aren't on the same page there. But I suspect that the questioner was thinking more about um, economic questions. Yeah, I mean, one, one, the, the, the classic low-hanging fruit on this, uh, on this front, where Smith seems to have gotten things really wrong, is his theory of value. I mean, Smith was an early subscriber to the labor theory of value which we have no shortage of, of studies uh, demonstrating uh, the shortcomings of that particular view. And it forces one to rethink how he understands a number of uh, commodity pricing and, and, and value. Um, why that actually really matters is um, Smith himself talks about the difference in things like uh, the pricing of diamonds versus the pricing of water. And he can't possibly understand from the perspective of the labor theory of value how it is that um, water prices might become something of significance. But again, here, as I sit in Wisconsin, I'm only uh, literally uh, blocks from uh, the, the world's uh, or North America's largest freshwater source in, in Lake Michigan. And that, of course, is a dramatically important, uh, growing and increasingly important question uh, in 21st century America. Uh, and uh, Smith does not seem to have been attuned to that for reasons I think we can forgive him for. But I do think that, that um, the theory, of, the labor theory of value is one place where we do have to set aside uh, some of his, uh, some of his uh, prognostication. And our last question for a bit of a change of pace will come from Joel Fulford from our Rice University chapter. He asks, lightheartedly, what country do you think Adam Smith would live in if he were alive today, and why? Oh, here's the truth. It would be France. Uh, Smith um, was a, uh, so he, he spent his whole life, uh, since it's a lighthearted question, I'll ask in a lighthearted, or answer in a lighthearted way. He was a, a mama's boy, and he spent his whole life close to home. He only left Great Britain once. Uh, and uh, that was to go to France, where he spent two really important years. Uh, he was meeting a bunch of very prominent economists and philosophers, the high age of the Enlightenment. To be in Paris in the 1760s was quite an event, and he made the most of it. But Smith really had this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, love of, of France and French culture, and, um, and the language in particular, and the literature. Um, and uh, I'm willing to say that even today, and this is going to get me in a lot of trouble with my Scottish friends, who, if they see this, will have said, oh, how did you blow it? Of course you'd want to come back to Scotland. I think you'd love Scotland and Scotland and what it's become. But I think that that lore of France and the love of French culture in particular uh, would, uh, w would still bring him back across the channel. So um, I think he might have some reservations about uh, the French economy. But yeah, his love of French culture uh, would have tempted him strongly, I 
Well, thank you so much, Professor. We really appreciate your time with us today. And like I said earlier, this was just a refreshing break, I think, for everybody uh, on the conference today. So thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. Tune in again next week, Thursday, April 30th, again at 1 p.m. Eastern, when we will hear from health tech entrepreneur and co-founder of Emoka Health, Sebastian Sager, on the coronavirus and its implications for telehealth. Check out our full upcoming lineup at adamsmithsociety.com. I want to wish everyone continued health and well-being, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone.